الحمد لله الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد أما بعد So with regards to the story of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam we have gone through 11 out of 12 ruku' like roughly few ayat left from the 11th ruku' which is a portion of Quran which is recited in prayer so just have a bit of idea what happened when Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam managed to meet the parents and the siblings and they after some time obviously spend good time together just reflect on the story of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam how he had been through a lot of trouble three major ones with the mistreatment of the brothers, causing him to have a very rough time at a very young age. And then separation from the father. And then he was subsequently being imprisoned without causing any issue at all, without having any trouble from his side, no mistakes at all, innocently was imprisoned at that point. But when he managed to get over with all of those, and managed to see the family, his demeanor, his attitude, his behavior, his response was such that only prophets are able to achieve that highest ever level, the highest eminence with regards to their morality, their respect, their courtesy, their nicety, their being able to forgive. He did not mention any of that. All he mentioned was the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said to his father, oh, my father, this is the dream that I saw and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with all the favors. He did not mention any of that. Rather, he took these episodes, these troubled times in his life as a means to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the positive light. So he said, in reverse order. So the first he mentioned about the imprisonment to so say, my Lord took me out of the prison. He took me out of the prison and he's thanking and glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. And then he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed me to meet my father and my brothers, my family. And he's thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that favor, the second affliction. And then he said that the animosity, the hatred, a temporary jealousy that was put in the heart of my brother against me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has replaced this with the love and unity between us. Now he's defending the brothers by saying that the devil's whisper cause them to do this against me, yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever was between us, he didn't mention any of that, he just said whatever was between us through shaitan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has replaced this with the love and unity that we had before all this. This is how he took everything in a very positive way. That's one thing that he learned from the story of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam, mashallah. And obviously then the story continued. So then Hassan Basri, one of the greatest of the Tabi'is, he said that Imam Ibn Kathir mentioned this in his tafsir about Sayyidina Yusuf al-Islam, that he was about seven years old when the brothers had thrown him in the well. And he remained separated for, according to him, 80 years. And then he lived 23 years after they met together. And then he died at the age of 120 years. But another narration is that he lived for about 40 years. This is Muhammad Ibn Ishaq's view. But obviously, these are all understanding and learning from the people of book, and they do differ on certain things. But anyway, whatever it was, Yaqub lived with Sayyidina Yusuf after they met in Egypt for about another 17 years, and then he passed away. Imam Qurtubi mentioned 
سيدنا يوسف عليه السلام when he was with his father and the father is about to die Yaqub alayhi salam he instructed that his body to be taken to the blessed place in Syria and that's exactly what happened so that is where this idea of people put putting the bodies of their loved ones and taking it to Beitul Maqdis in modern day Palestine area. And this is custom now for the people to be buried as a special place, which is obviously a very special place anyway. In our Sharia of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is discouraged to move bodies from wherever they die. This is stay wherever they pass away, unless there's a good reason for that, which normally is not. So we shouldn't be transporting body from one country to another. But for them, it was perfectly fine. In their Sharia, it was okay uh, to be buried in a blessed place. So this is exactly what Sayyidina Yaqub ended up being buried in. And likewise, Yusuf Salam subsequently. Now, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he is reported of saying that there were about 93 to 100 people who came with Sayyidina Yaqub as a whole family with their children and you know, grandchildren. And when they left about 4, 000, 400 years later, with Sayyidina Musa salam, when he delivered them all from the clutches of Pharaoh subsequently, there were about 700,000 people close to that number. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplied them in Egypt for to that, from the seven tribes, uh, from the 12 tribes of Sayyidina Yaqub salam, 12 children, 12 tribes, and they continued to multiply and over that many years. And this is despite despite during the time of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, there were 90,000 boys, young baby boys were killed when the magicians mentioned to Sayyidina during the time of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, to Pharaoh that there would be a young boy from Bani Israel who would kill you. So he got all the boys killed at that time. And even then, they had about this many people, mashallah. This is the barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the former Aziz of Misr, who bought and then raised Sayyidina Yusuf salam, he died. The king of Egypt then managed to get Zulaikha salam, to marry Sayyidina Yusuf salam. And then he had they together had two sons, Ephraim and Mansha, according to Torah and the Old Testament, and a girl called Rahma. And this Rahma daughter married to Sayyidina Ayyub. And from the children of Ephraim came this particular prophet called Yusha bin Nun. Yusha bin Nun, and he was a successor of Sayyidina Musa. When Sayyidina Musa was in this. Valley of Tia, they this was main disciple. This Yusha bin Nun is the same one who was with Sayyidina Musa salam, when he was traveling to meet Khidr. Salam. So this is how this family carried on. Sayyidina Yusuf salam, died at the age of 120, and he was buried around there. Sorry, he was buried in around in River Nile. He, his body wasn't moved to the Palestine. Urwa bin Zubair mentioned as Ibn Ishaq, the historian, famous historian, the Sira narrator. He reports when Sayyidina Musa -Islam was commanded to leave Egypt with Bani Israel, it was revealed to him that he should not leave the body of Sayyidina Yusuf -Islam in Egypt. And he was ordered to take it with him to Syria and bury him close to his ancestor. So Sayyidina Yusuf -Islam was then taken from this place to Palestine. And Musa -Islam 
finalized it. After Sayyidina Yusuf -Salam, the Amalika took over Egypt and they had the pharaohs controlling the area. They were living according to the teaching of Sayyidina Yusuf -Salam. With time, they started getting change in their understanding, in their Sharia, in their learning. And slowly and slowly, they all went on to their way and kept keeping themselves distant from the main teaching. However, they still were believers. Uh, but they were subjected to a lot of torture and oppression by the Pharaoh and, and, and the local people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped them out through Sayyidina so Musa as we would see in the Quran in different places, inshallah, subsequently. Yusuf when he met father and they spent time together, he then inquired, oh my father, I heard that you lost your eyes and, I've, and you were so much in agony for missing me. And, why was that? I'm, I'm just inquiring to understand what was the reason that I did not hear that you were contented with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And obviously this is very, very odd position to be in when you as a prophet would not subdue to the, to, to the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there must be a good reason for this. Please explain that to me. So Yaqub responded in a very, very nice way. He said, I was concerned about the Iman, about your faith and about your company. The fact that you have left, you were not with me anymore and with the people around us. I did not know where you were and what would happen to you in future whether you would be living with Muslims, and obviously there was no other Muslim in that area, wherever you have been. And I was concerned that if you lost your faith, I would not see you in this dunya. And God forbid, if you were not a Muslim, I would not even see you in the life hereafter. And concern in dunya, whatever trials come, we, you know, submit to it. We stay contented but when it comes to the life hereafter. It becomes so much of a problem. So I couldn't bear the even thought of this idea that whether you are a Muslim or not. But when I found out, Alhamdulillah, I'm so happy now. So that was a very important and strong message from Sayyidina Yaqub and giving us parents, especially our future parents, to think about our children and be concerned about their life hereafter, their Iman. And this is what exactly he did. Even on his deathbed, Sayyidina Yaqub was speaking to this, these children, bringing them all together. And he said, when the death came to him, man abudu, who, who would you, you know, worship? And they said, you know, who would you worship after me? Are you going to change your religion? Who are you going to worship after me? We will follow our father, our forefathers, Ibrahim, Ishaq, and you know, yeah, like, like Ibrahim and all, all those pious people. So he was contented with that. He was very happy that, alhamdulillah, my children would continue to be on this right path. And that should be the ultimate claim and concern, ultimate goal of, of us as parents, inshallah, as, as a community as well. So anyway, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after this, he said, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim, bismillahir rahman rahim, zalika min anba'il ghaybi nuhihi ilayk. This is from the news of unseen, which we reveal to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ma kunta ladayhim, il ajma'u amrahum wa hum yankurun. And you were not present with them when they put together their plan while they conspired. You can say, you know, Yusuf alayhi salam. And that was the answer to the question the Jewish people gave to the Quraysh, the, you know, the pagan Meccans, to ask this man about Yusuf salam and what has been narrated about him. So let's see if he knew the detail of this particular prophet, which was revealed in our books, and people have actually forgotten even from our text. This is something very, very uh, uncommon as a knowledge. So then he definitely been inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why they ask this question and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a detailed account of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam in the most beautiful way with all the details in one place. And uh, it was presented in such a way that that was now going to benefit Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They still stayed 
in denial. They did not accept. So Rasulullah was very hopeful. Then since I responded through the revelation in such a way that they are going to submit to it. But unfortunately, when truth came, they did not accept it. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and most of the people are not going to believe. Even though the proofs of his being a prophet were clear, and even if he himself longed for it or tried his best, the sense of the statement is, your duty is to spread the call and seek the betterment of people that you succeeded in it is not in your control, nor is it your responsibility, nor should you be grieving over, over this. And most of the people, although you strive for it, are not going to believe. They're not going to be accepting the message. That was a, obviously a very clear idea from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet for Rasulullah it was heartbreaking because he was trying his best. But the Makkans, the family, the relatives, the people in the community, they didn't accept it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very clear that we should be effort oriented or effort oriented rather than the outcome oriented. Our attitude is I want this as an outcome. If there was no result, my expected result, then I'm unhappy and I'm upset. I get depressed. People do get, even the religious people, even the pious people, they get so disappointed by not getting the outcome they long for and yet as a human being this is natural but this is not a sought after goal this is something that you leave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you resign completely without going too much into that you know human emotional attachment to the outcome rather we should grow out of it because whatever happens happens with the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the decree with the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to change our attitude that everything becomes smooth. As long as I am sticking to Sharia, as long as I'm following the path of my Lord, as long as I'm following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's way, according to their teaching, according to how scholars and ulama have taught us for 1400 years, I stick on this track, regardless of whether I achieve anything or not. And that is why you would find in hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari and others, that they will be on the day of judgment. They will be on the day of judgment. Prophets who would have one person believing in them. For some, there'll be none who would accept them and took shahada based on the teaching of this prophet. Obviously the revelation and the support that these prophets get, people should just listen to them. And they are the best of the people of the time, the best character. Everything is just so perfect. And yet only one person or no one accepting them as a prophet. They could not convert anyone. They could not make anyone realize that. What does that mean? In the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't matter what you achieved. What matters, what did you work for? What was your jiddu jihad? What was your efforts? So... We are only whatever we do as a hard work, that is what is going to be our due reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on rather than what we feel. If the outcome was there, fine. Alhamdulillah. If we get some outcome, that is another important aspect of our life as a human being. We would want to get some benefits in this world as well, some outcome. That is not expectation from us. So we shouldn't be too much concerned about that. Because many a time the outcome might not mean that we would achieve what we wanted to achieve, which is the salvation and love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if someone comes to the truth through you, through me, through others, and we achieve what we wanted to achieve, that might not be the guarantee that we would be coming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because we might just change. We might have done it for some other reasons, some ulterior motives. We would just focus on the goal itself rather than true love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be effort oriented and do all of that in accordance with the Sharia. And that's that's the bottom line. The hidayah, the outcome would come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whenever and however Allah would will. 
Then he says, "What do you ask him for? In who Allah is the Creator, the Almighty? You did not ask of them of any payment, any reward. It is not accept a reminder to the world. They should all learn and understand the message. There's Tanziliya ayah, certain ayahs which is which are revealed to prove the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam or any prophet in the Quran, and the Takwiniya which establishes the signs." The presence of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala as a Creator. So, what can any of the ayats in the heavens and the earth be compared to it? They are silent and they are silent. So, up to this point, all the previous ayats were dealing with the verification of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a Prophet. Whatever he was saying, they are establishing Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's prophethood. From now on, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is going to give this idea that there are many signs within the heavens and the earth. And they pass over them, but they turn away from it. They look at that, they realize, and they reject it. These signs do not help them. Why? Because they have not got the intention to learn from. They do not want to take anything from it. They do not listen to the well wisher. They realize that this is the true prophet of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Yes, and yet the arrogance. The obstinacy. They they do not want to accept it. They reject it. They have seen all the signs of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. They keep passing by without even paying any attention to it. They would not look at even the punishment the people before them have gone through by rejecting the prophets. So they know it through their books, through the you know stories that they heard from people. And yet, they would not open up. They would not realize what they're doing. وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ إِلَّا وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ And most of them will not believe in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala except while they associate. And what they're doing? They're associating partners. Even if they, re- they either reject Allah Subhanahu wa Taala completely, or if they believe, they attach another god. They attach some partners to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Ibn Kathir, rahmatullah, has said. They could be even Muslims who believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, but they are involved in a different kind of shirk, not the idolaters. That's a group which is included, which has been mentioned here. The rejecters, the first one, the second one is the the idolaters or associating partners with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But even the Muslims who believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yet some of them may end up committing this different type of shirk. Which is ostentation, show off. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "The most dangerous of things I apprehend for you is the small shirk, the shirk al khafi." When the Sahaba asked as to what that could be, he said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, hypocrisy is a small shirk, hypocrisy, nifaq, hypocrisy, which is that you're doing something in order to please someone else. The ulterior motive is something else." Likewise, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Swearing by other than Allah is this type of shirk." Likewise, taking vows and offerings in the name of other than Allah is a type of shirk as well. So you are sacrificing an animal, not for Allah, not to get the closeness to Allah, but to get the closeness and nearness, the qurb to this particular pious person, even the prophets, even the Whoever, yet not for the sake of Allah. So you do not do that. This is an act of worship that should only be done to Allah. Yes, you slaughter or you donate that reward, that you know meal or that money or whatever things that you want to do as charity to please Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But the reward of this could be donated to that individual. That's a different matter. No, that's allowed. This is okay. This is cool. Isfalu sawab, donating the reward. That's a different matter. We cover that in in detail at some other point. But this is done to please Allah in the name of Allah, and then the reward is then given to that individual. That's okay. But sometimes people do it in order to come close to that individual through that action. This is called or this is the ibadah, and that is shirk. That is haram by consensus.
اف امنوا ان تاتيهم غاشيه من عذاب الله او تاتيهم الساعه بغته وهم لا يشعرون then do they feel secure that they will not come to them an overwhelming aspect of the punishment of Allah or that the hour will not come upon them suddenly when they do not proceed they don't know it can come they should be careful about that this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to admonish them after giving all the positivities now the trouble that there is a room for warning and that is why the prophets are called bashir as well as nadhir they do tabshir mean they give the bashara the glad tidings but they also do in that they warn it's not just you appreciate all the time unfortunately it has become a problem in the modern time where you do not tell off at all you do not rebuke anyone you keep giving positive responses with that you expect that they would change their behavior but many a time they don't there are people who would want to have you know a lot of favors and then they improve people who deal with carrots and they're happy with that but they're certain with stick as well they need to have that you have to have affection but you should also be cautioning people you have to ensure that and i just give you a small story about saying that imam tanwi rahmatullah alayhi so he passed away about 100 years ago or so from india one of the greatest of the you know faqih and mujtahid and also a qari of quran plus a spiritual master so it was mufassir as well he done a lot of work mashallah but anyway so this mona shafri thanwi sahab rahmatullah alayhi he had a student once he came like a common man he would come to his circle and he asked him ustad i get this waswasa this whisper that i should become christian i'm feeling inclined towards christianity not that i believe in that it's just that i feel like doing it and this is a waswasa coming to my mind all the time so sheikh explained to him once twice three times first day second day third day and he kept asking the same thing would go home ponder over it and come back same issue same issue and in the majlis he mentioned that again the third time after the fourth time she has exhausted all his you know wisdom and explanation and everything and it was known in those days it could be told off anyway but this time and she has every time is i was very strict in most of the cases if need be and he was in that majlis like you know is is life going on with so many people around and this man kept saying the same thing and sheer slapped him on his face straight in front of everyone and he get him you know so kicked out of the room go out allah leave islam if you don't want to and then you, allah doesn't need you go and he had that you know strong slap on his face and he got completely stunned he sat for few seconds few couple of minutes and he raised his head he said ya sheikh, ya sheikh. my was was has gone i do not feel that i want to be christian anymore i'm done i'm so to jazakallah for that so sometimes you need to do that operation in olden days especially it was a norm but nowadays obviously it's a taboo it's a, so the, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give you good tidings all the favors all the positive positives but also sometimes you need to be but strict that there will be some punishment as a deterrent sometimes and some someone would need it at times so inshallah ta'ala keep that in mind so here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it very clear if you are you waiting for a punishment from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what would wake you up alam ya'ni lil ladina amanu takhsha qulubun min dhikrillah has time not come to wake up to improve the situation inshallah ta'ala so from this ayah we just cover it next week next week inshallah ta'ala a few more ayahs to go and this surah will be finished next week inshallah ta'ala